Hello, and welcome to this talk about my favorite composer, and I hope your favorite composer as well. So, Johann Sebastian Bach looms so large in our imagination as musicians and as pianists. We see him as that stern figure with a big wig in the famous portrait who stares down at us over all these centuries as if to say, you people can't play my stuff or understand it, so why do you even bother? But the reality wasn't like that at all. Of course he was this great Kapellmeister, a great organist, a great harpsichordist, a composer uh, for the centuries and all that, but he was also a teacher and a father of 20 children, mind you. And uh, his students adored him and four of his sons became better known and more famous than he did, so he must have been pretty good as a teacher. So Bach's pedagogical literature, the pieces he wrote, to teach his students and to teach his sons are wonderful and we neglect them at our own peril and to our own loss. Bach's best known pedagogical compositions are of course inventions and symphonias. These are written to introduce the student to uh, elements of composition, invention, uh, independence of the hands, and learning the contrapuntal style. The little preludes, on the other hand, have a completely different goal. Um, their aim is to teach the student how to play expressively. So you might be tempted to say at this point, what do you mean play expressively? Baroque pieces are to be played with cleanliness and precision and let's leave their expression to the romantics. If you feel this way, you're in good company. This attitude grew out of the late 19th century where um, Bach was felt to be a glorious relic, but a relic nevertheless. Here's a fascinating example from a French pianist, Eugène d'Albert, from his own um, edition of the Welton Proclivian, from the foreword. This is what Eugène d'Albert has to say. He says, Bach knew nothing about the subtleties of passion, sorrow, and love, and he never thought to express them in music. Um, in a paragraph before that, it's um, in some ways even worse. He says people who claim they enjoy listening to a concert of Bach are either liars or pedants. Another common argument I hear when I suggest playing Bach expressively is that the keyboard instruments of Bach's day, the organ and the harpsichord, could not do dynamics in the sense in which we modern pianists understand them. And indeed this is correct. The harpsichord particularly, of course, works um, by plucking the key rather than striking it and uh, indeed one keyboard cannot do more than one dynamic. Good harpsichord is of course naturally create expression by means other than dynamics the way we understand them. Um, they do it through timing, through adding more or fewer notes. But the most important thing to remember about uh, Baroque performance is this. By Bach's time the harpsichord has become much too loud, too big, and far too expensive. So if you're a small child, you didn't practice on a harpsichord, you practiced on a humble little clavichord. Now, clavichord is a direct ancestor of the modern piano. It works by the, the hammer actually touching and striking directly the string. The clavichord is capable of a great deal more dynamics than even the piano does. It can crescendo in a single note. It can diminuendo suddenly, it can even do vibrato. It's a fascinating instrument. On top of that, it is very quiet, extremely quiet. You cannot hear it. So just like you would practice today in your headphones on your electric piano, not to disturb your neighbors or your family, that's what you did on the clavichord. But how often, when you tell a student to play expressively, what you get is what I call Bachmanian. You get a muddy pedal, you get over the top rubato, you get dynamics that go up and down like a roller coaster, none of which works in the Baroque period because these are all romantic inventions. So what uh, do we do? How do we create expression without using romantic means? Well, we use means which are Baroque in nature and which Bach sets out to teach us in the little preludes. What we do specifically is we neglect our 200 years of romantic training and we stop looking for melody and accompaniment everywhere. And so instead what we do is we consider the harmony. In these little pieces, harmony is king, queen, and the entire court. 
So let's look at each prelude in turn and figure out what makes each one tick. The preludes are divided into two groups of 12 and of 6. This was done in the 19th century, not by Bach. Um, the 12 are somewhat easier than the 6, so we will start with them. The first prelude in C major is a fascinating study in broken chords, presented in two different ways. In the first half, both hands sharing the chord, and in the second half, in the right hand in a cadenza-like fashion. Because the mind loves finding melodic elements, I choose to treat the left hand in the first half as more or less melodic and to tease out special and favorite melody notes in the second half, as you can see in the chart. The ornaments in the left hand continue to cause problems for students. Um, they are quite difficult and you may choose to simplify them. But in case you would like to know what the original was like, the best source is Bach's own uh, table of ornaments in the clavier book line for Wilhelm uh, Friedman Bach. <laughs> primarily of broken chords, this time used more melodically. Most important aspect to discuss here is the metric organization of this melody. Any melody can be either trochaic or iambic in nature. These terms come from poetry and they tell us whether each phrase or each strophe in a poem begins on a strong beat and ends on a weak beat, which would make it trochaic, or begins on a weak beat and ends on a strong beat, which would make it iambic. Here's an easy example of a trochaic rhythm. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty took a great fall. And here the poem becomes iambic. And all the king's horses and all the king's men, etc. In this prelude, as in most of Bach's music, as in most music in general, the patterns tend to be iambic, meaning that they start on a weak beat and go through um, the bar line to the next measure. The problem with this is that uh, the way we notate music with beams and bar lines prevents us from understanding that when we first look at the page. And unless you have a very good addition, uh, your student might become um, confused about the rhythm and start making big accents on the downbeat. This prevents music from flowing and it makes it sound very boxy and stodgy. form. There is no melody at all. The piece was written originally for the lute and you can hear that texture really quite clearly. What I find most useful in um, designing your interpretation is to look at the bass line. Does the bass line move, usually in a stepwise fashion, or does it get stuck, quote unquote, to become a pedal point and whether that means the tension is increasing or decreasing. Thank you. 
language of the fourth prelude is achieved by its very complicated voice leading. We have to work extra hard to uh, figure out the fingering that allows all the holds to actually happen. The prelude is in fact an allemand, one of those stylized dances that always appears first in all of Bach's um, dance suites. The allemand actually is quite a slow dance, not at all the motoric exercise um, that one often hears. Here's one beautiful example I found. As usual, Bach is so very clever about how he structures his movements. The very simple subject here has essentially two parts, which are used independently throughout the piece. Perhaps you can imagine a choreography for each of these little segments and imagine a beautiful dance in your mind. In prelude number five, the broken chords are back, but this time they're enlivened by the use of the hemiola technique, which is a rhythmic device where a measure with six eighth notes can be either heard as six eight or three four. Some measures in this piece sound much more natural as either one or the other, and some are ambiguous, always keeping us, the performer and the listener, on our toes. Prelude number six is another charming allemand. It's so easy to visualize the two dances responding to each other, sometimes dancing together, sometimes moving separately. To separate them orally, I use the harpsichord technique of allowing just a little bit of extra time in between the entries of two different voices. Thank you. 
Prelude number seven is another elegant and beautiful dance for two, this time a minuet. What's truly special about this prelude is the expressive use of appoggiaturas. According to one of Bach's own students, Nicholas Forkel, Bach often wrote little pieces to incorporate the patterns and exercises he had the students practice. Prelude number eight in F major is a wonderful example of that. I think of it as that, yes, practicing your chord progressions was definitely worth it, Prelude. Prelude number nine is in the style of the Baroque Concerto Grosso, sort of like a miniature Italian concerto. In the Concerto Grosso, a large group of instruments, called the Ripieno, alternates with a small solo group called the Concertino. So, of course, the small solo group is capable of playing with a great deal of nuance and sophistication, and the larger group plays music which is much more straightforward. So, depending on who you think is playing at a particular moment, the music has quite a different character. So, here is my idea for who does what in this prelude, but of course it is much more fun to come up with your own plan. Prelude number 10 was originally composed as a trio for a minuet, and so it carries all the sophisticated simplicity of that genre. To highlight its great expressive quality, I suggest finding the hidden appoggiaturas within the melody. Thank you. 
Prelude number 11 is a very special piece. It's one of only three works still existing today um, that have fingerings in Bach's own hand. Let me point out a few interesting ones. This is where Bach puts uh, both the thumb and the pinky on a black note. I've argued with so many students who would rather do gymnastics on the piano and acrobatics of every kind rather than do so. So here's your official permission. Thumb and pinky do go on black notes if necessary in Bach's own handwriting. Structurally, the piece is another lovely minuet. It helps a great deal in playing it to visualize two and later more dancers doing something graceful and lovely on the dance floor, sometimes imitating each other's gestures, sometimes moving together, sometimes moving one at a time. It would be a grave mistake to treat the left hand at any point as mere accompaniment. It is always a full partner. The phrases flow beautifully one into the other when treated iambically, in other words, beginning on the weak beat and going right to the next strong beat. Now let's deal with the elephant in the room. And the main reason why this beautiful prelude is so little performed, and that is the huge difficulty of the abundance of ornamentation in both the right and the left hands here. There is a good reason why composers stopped writing as much ornamentation once piano overtook the harpsichord as the principal keyboard instrument. Um, ornamentation is much too difficult on the piano. I often uh, perform on the harpsichord, and as I find myself usually practicing on the piano, what happens during every performance on a harpsichord is that I play exactly twice as many notes for every single ornament as I had originally planned for the piano. They seem to play themselves. So the solution for students, especially younger and inexperienced ones, is to either cut down the number of ornaments or to simplify them. Still, it would be wonderful to be able to play this music with all the flourishes and the richness and the sophistication which the composer intended. In other words, with all of the ornaments the way they are written. So first let me remind you that we need not guess at what the symbols mean, that the Bach uh, ornament table is a wonderful guide and tells us everything we need to know. In order to play the particularly difficult ornaments on the piano, it helps to use the technique invented by Ferruccio Busoni, the great German-Italian pianist, who taught us so much about the way we see Bach in the world today. Um, this technique is called metricization, where you simply write the ornaments out in note values that we can understand. Perhaps after the ornament has been well learned and digested, it can become free. But uh, it is very difficult, especially for a student, to learn it like that in the first place. I must admit that when I learn difficult ornaments, I metricize them as well. My final suggestion is to avoid using urtext editions when working with students. It has been my observation that ornament signs tend to produce only fear and loathing in children. Um, there are many wonderful editions available today with ornaments written out that make even the most complicated preludes and also symphonias and inventions possible for all students. The A minor prelude is the most intensely emotional one of this entire set and should be played, in my opinion, much more slowly than one usually hears it. In structure, it is a simple invention, 
but the subject is anything but simple. The rhythm of the subject is repetitive and straightforward, so we know our attention is being directed elsewhere. The subject consists of repeated notes on the strong beat and a series of appoggiaturas. As we have already seen, the appoggiatura is one of Bach's favorite expressive devices. According to the Baroque doctrine of affections, the appoggiatura represents a sigh. And as in life, a sigh can express a variety of emotions. In this prelude, the sigh seems to be filled with anguish. The counter subject varies the material in fascinating ways and we can choose which feature to showcase to create the most interesting performance. For example, the previously repeated notes on the strong beat now acquire a life all of their own and move in beautiful ways. The appoggiatura lines also now move independently, sometimes staying in place, sometimes mirroring the subject, and sometimes creating a melody all of their own. Or you may decide that the most interesting thing for you is the endlessly changing intervallic relationship between the subject and the counter subject. Another interesting feature of this prelude, one we have already seen before, is the presence of cadenza-like passages. In my observation, in Bach's works, these always occur where the tension reaches its highest peak and simply cannot be maintained anymore. These should be played non-metronomically and very freely and with a great expression. short preludes. These are more difficult and designed for the advancing pianist. The first prelude in C major is Bach's answer to Scarlatti sonatas. It is in simple binary form, not what we understand as sonata form today, that is at least two generations removed. However, what it does have are two themes which are very clearly defined and contrasting in character. The first one is masculine, very energetic. The second one is the feminine theme, flowing and elegant. It works best to vary not just the dynamics of the two themes, but also and especially the touch, the way a harpsichordist would define the themes. In the masculine first theme, I would recommend a very detached, almost staccato-like approach to the 16 notes. But in the feminine second theme, what would work best would be a very smooth legato, perhaps even a super legato, where the 16 notes are ever so slightly overlapped to create nicer flow. important. One leads and another follows. The rhythm here, at first glance, 
seems absolutely constant, even boring. But with just a little study, we can find a great deal of variety. Some phrases are iambic, other phrases are trochaic, and in yet others, not every note is melody, creating a beautiful dance-like figure. trio sonata. For those of you who may not be Baroque music aficionados like me, a Baroque trio sonata actually involves four performers, two solo instruments, and a continuo group consisting of a keyboard and a bass instrument like a viola da gamba. The continuo group plays a bass line and a harmonic progression indicated by numbers. This is known as a figured bass and may elaborate it in any way that they wish. And the solo instruments play pre-written melodic lines. Trio sonatas were written primarily for home use and the enjoyment of the performers, something to do at house parties where musicians would gather together and wish to jam. A lot of freedom is available in these pieces. For example, any instrument will do really. You can substitute violin for the flute or the oboe or a bassoon for the cello and so on and so forth. And if a harpsichord is not available, you can use the lute. The closest modern equivalent to this is the jazz trio or jazz small ensemble where the continuum function of rhythm and harmony is provided by some combination of piano, double bass and drum set and then solo instruments improvise over it. In a really fun aside, French Baroque music, as a matter of fact, is the direct precursor of jazz. So French Baroque musicians uh, in escaping the French Revolution settled in Louisiana where they were exposed to music from Africa and the Caribbean, and it is the combination of the two styles that gave us the genre of jazz. The left hand here imitates the sort of a part viola da gamba would play, and its role as a continual instrument in the trio sonata. The rhythm is extremely stable, and the motion is mainly stepwise. This is a typical Baroque walking bass, and should be played detached. Where the left hand part becomes more melodic or jagged intervallically, of course you can use your own discretion. 
The string of appoggiaturas in the right hand in the beginning is traditionally played ornamented with trills, which must be played on the beat and followed by a diminuendo for the resolution note. The fun and popular E major prelude number no. 5 presents us with interesting interpretive challenges. It is made up of two subjects, one in eighth notes and one in sixteenths, which are very different in character and both seem to be equally important. How to choose which one to emphasize? Well, thankfully, the prelude has two halves, each one is repeated twice, so whatever decision you make, you can then change it on either in the next half or the next repetition. So let's say now you've made a decision about which subject you would like to emphasize, but you still have to make decisions about structure, phrasing, and dynamics. How do you do that? I think the best way is to get inside Bach's beautiful mind by trying to follow the clues that he's left behind and to try to understand his intent. Let's start by examining the eighth note subject. As you can see, the subject is two measures long in the beginning and appears like that two more times throughout the piece. However, the rest of the appearances of the subject are truncated, they're only one measure long. This happens many times throughout the first half and every time during the second half. I think this is a very meaningful clue. I choose to interpret the dynamics quite differently depending on the length of the subject and make the long subject have longer dynamic shape than the short one. As you can see, I colored the 16th note subject pink to differentiate it from the more masculine sounding blue. The pink subject does the same thing as the blue subject did in the first half and breaks in half, and so the units are now one measure long. In the second half, however, even more interesting things happen. The pink subject now bifurcates further forming units that are only half a measure long. I choose to showcase that to the listener by creating dynamic arches depending on the length of the unit. In other words, whether the unit is two measures long or one measure long or half a measure long, it gets a hairpin dynamic. See if you can follow or agree with my thinking process as you listen to this performance.
Attribute number six has a little of everything we've already discussed. It's another stately minuet where the two hands represent the two partners, absolutely equal in importance, sometimes one leading and the other following and then switching places. The gestures work best when they are treated iambically. In groups of 16th notes, all may be melodic or only some. Finally, once again, a pochettura is at elegance and grace and charm and must be strictly observed. <laughs> There are so many available today, quite varied in quality, from rather dubious uh, free versions floating around the internet to the highly scholarly or text ones. The edition you pick can be a huge factor in your student's success. Some teachers insist that students use only good or text editions like the Henley. I tend to disagree with that when it comes to the pieces of Bach. Confronted with unfamiliar style and strange looking ornament symbols, I think the student needs lots more help than these can provide. Here, compare a page of the Henley on the left next to my old trusted Palmer edition on the right. If you are a student, which one would you rather pick? The Palmer provides ornament realizations, lots more fingerings and even performance suggestions. You can choose to agree or disagree with these but they are marked in lighter print, so the student will not be tempted to think that you're changing something the composer wrote. A few words about historical editions. If you've ever heard me talk about the music of Bach, you know sooner or later I will rant about the Czerny editions. These are extremely important historically. Not only were they the first scholarly editions of Bach's works, but they also represent, supposedly, the way Czerny's teacher, Beethoven, actually played these pieces. However, these editions present many, many problems. Uh, for example, there are many wrong notes in the Well-Tempered Clavier. For the little preludes, the problem is simpler. Take a look at the E minor prelude. Look at Czerny's slurs. Do you notice that every single one of them ends before the bar line? If you were to play anything like that, it would sound very boxy and stodgy and square. Now, it is not impossible that Czerny, in my opinion, uses slurs the way Beethoven did, idiosyncratically. And in fact, what the slurs mean, that as soon as the slur ends, the next note is actually the arrival point. But there's absolutely no reason to be explaining that concept to a student, I think. Equally unusable today are the equally historically important editions by Ferruccio Busoni. You may know that Busoni is responsible for the birth of what we know today as Baroque performance practice. He introduced concepts like terrace dynamics, metricized ornaments, and structural dynamics. But his scholarship is over a hundred years out of date. However, his editions are still valuable to us today for the wealth of comments, analysis, and especially teaching suggestions. Take a look at his little transcription of the D major prelude for piano four hands. This is an invaluable tool to help the student understand the dialogue between the two voices with normally in the right hand. Thank you for joining me on this journey 
through Bach's little preludes. I hope you have been inspired to play them and to teach them. And so now, let me leave you with just a little history. This is from Johann Nikolaus Forkel, who was Bach's first biographer. The first thing Bach did, said Forkel, was to teach his students his particular manner of touching the instrument. For this purpose, he made them practice isolated exercises for all the fingers of both hands. But if he found that anyone, after some months of practice, began to lose patience, he was so obliging as to write appropriate little pieces in which those exercises were combined together. Of this kind are the little preludes and even the inventions. He wrote these down during the hours of teaching and in so doing attended to the momentary need of the student but afterwards he transformed them into beautiful, expressive little works of art.